Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Bodang damang sanggang nama sami. I'm very happy to be here in Seattle. Um, coming from a week visiting my home monastery, Abayagiri, um, which was just a really lovely experience. Um, and I thought, you know, oftentimes when we do that chant um, where we think about that I'm of the nature to age and sicken and die and everything I love that's beloved and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separate. It's like each step is like, like a punch in the gut and you're kind of just, oh, like really, another one, another one? It's just, it can be a bit depressing for people who are uh, new to these kind of reflections. Um, so I thought maybe I could even uh, possibly start with a joke. And I'm not sure if I'm actually going to get to the joke, uh, but, but I'll tell you the context for the joke, which is kind of beautiful. So, uh, yeah, being at Abayagiri, uh, probably most people here have not been to a monastery. Um, but monasteries are places of paradox. They're places of mixtures of light and dark, and places of dukkha, or unsatisfactoriness, and places of sukha, or, or bliss, or happiness. And the joke that I was told uh, took place in the Terra's vestry. So vestry, I think it's a Christian term, which means basically a place where monastics put on clothes or robes. And Terra is a monk who's been in robes for 10 years. So these are, these are pretty hardcore people. Uh, these are pretty tough, tough cookies. Um, basically, if you meditate every day for two hours and 45 minutes, then in a year, you will have meditated for 1,000 hours, and in 10 years, you will have meditated for 10,000 hours. So, I mean, there's no exact correlation between number of hours and expertise, but almost by definition, anybody who's uh, been living at monasteries for 10 years or more has some level of expertise in meditation. They spend a lot of time kind of in the, in the ring, so to speak. So this is a, a tough room. Um, yeah, you have people in there who, during retreat times, wear hats over their eyes so they don't have to look at anybody else. And uh, just, they're great people. Um, they're certainly some of my best friends. Um, but they're tough. And um, yeah, especially if you don't really know them, you might look at them and be quite intimidated, but the monk in particular who told me this, uh, this joke, he's one of the toughest. He's one of the toughest. He um, once lost part of his finger in the workshop, and I asked him, uh, Ajahn, did you cry when your finger got cut off? And he said, he's got a low voice, he said, I don't know if I cried, <laughs> but I did stick around to clean up the blood. <laughs> so, so this is a tough person. This is a, a tough guy. And he, English, I think, is his second or third language. So he's in, practice, in telling a joke. You know, some people might say, oh, are, are monks allowed to tell jokes? Is that really OK? But for him, it's totally allowable. He's practicing his English. Um, and yeah, it just, for a place like this, a terrorist vestry, where the mood is rather serious, like we're giving our lives to this practice, like nibbana or bust, you know, is the, the overarching theme in these, these, this room. So it can be good to lighten, lighten the space and uh, bring some levity to the, to the mood. So it's actually just he and I in this space, but he says, can I tell you a joke? And I say, 
uh, yeah, I, I would like that. And he says, okay, so a pony goes to the doctor and the pony says, doctor, my throat is so itchy, it's so, so dry. <laughs> and the doctor looks in the horse's, in the, the pony's throat and he says, don't worry, don't worry. You're just a little horse. <laughs> and it was almost more a practice of gratitude and metta than actual humor, but uh, very enjoyable. And, uh, and I think that's a good uh, entrance into this whole question of like sukha and dukkha on the path. Um, the first noble truth, it's dukkha. There is suffering in life. There is unsatisfactoriness. There is not quite perfectibility to be found in sight, smells, taste, touch, um, all the things which most people are used to getting their gratification from. Um, so first noble truth, it's right, it's right up there. Uh, but there's a huge place for sukha on the path, sukha being the opposite of dukkha, sukha being a word both for happiness and for pleasure even. And you can think of the Buddhist path actually being a path of increasing skill at happiness. It's a path of getting better and better at pleasure, better and better at happiness. There's a, a Dhammapada quote uh, somewhere around like 290, late 290s, which is, if by abandoning a lesser sukha, a lesser happiness, a lesser, lesser pleasure, you gain a higher pleasure, then the wise person would abandon that lesser pleasure in order to gain a higher pleasure. Um, there's a really beautiful and thought-provoking uh, statement by one of the foremost scholar monks in Thailand named P.A. Paiuto. And at first when I heard it, I didn't quite understand it, uh, but the, the sentiment was, so when we first come to practice, there are so many things that make us suffer and so few things that bring us happiness. But as you practice along the path, and this is a good metric for how your practice is going, there are fewer and fewer things which make you suffer and more and more things which bring you happiness. That's kind of profound. Um, and it's good here to see what do we mean? What do you actually mean by happiness? What do you mean by pleasure? What do you mean by, by suffering? because that, that statement really can be quite enigmatic. It, it might just, what it, it's almost, you know, in English, happiness and pleasure, they're almost used in so many different contexts that they become not quite meaningless, you know, the general valence of things, but um, not quite clear. But the U Buddha used words in a very clear way. He defined his terms very explicitly. So we have a, another sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, number 139, which is the sutta on non-conflict. And here the Buddha said, uh, practitioners, you should know how to define sukha. You should know how to define pleasure or happiness. And having known this, you should pursue, you should yoke your heart, yunjati. You should pursue pleasure or happiness internally. And then he goes on, after giving this great allowance uh, to pursue happiness, pleasure, he goes on to define first a type of pleasure which is not to be pursued, not to be developed, not to be cultivated. And he says, there is the pleasure and delight which comes from sights cognizable or seeable with the eyes. So sights which are wished for, desired, agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. So, <laughs> this is all the, the beautiful, you know, things of the world, which the Buddha is very clear, are not evil and are not necessarily problematic in and of themselves. There are some religions or some ways of even understanding Buddhism that really uh, almost victim blame the sense world. So it's the fault of the sights, sounds, smells, taste, touch, that I'm gonna suffer. But the Buddha said, no, no, it's actually my own delight and lust, my own attachment 
to the sight, sm sound, smells, taste, touch, which are the problem. So the sights, so that's the beautiful things. Um, the sounds, which are wished for, desired, agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. Uh, the sukha and the uh, pleasure which come from this, these are sensual pleasures, and they're not to be cultivated, not to be developed, not to be pursued. Similarly with smells and uh, touch, sights, sounds, smells, taste, and touch. So these five things are called the five chords of sensuality, the kama guna, and they're not to be developed, cultivated, pursued. But the Buddha doesn't stop there, because that would, again, be a little bit depressing, because that's most of the way most of us get our, our hits from the world. Um, but the Buddha continued, he said, but there is this internal pleasure which we can uh, give ourselves to. And what is that, that type of pleasure? He first defines it as the four jhanas. So jhanas are absorptive meditative states. Um, yeah, sometimes referred to as absorptions or basically very deep meditative concentrations where you're fully delved into your, your meditation object. You're fully at peace more and more, increasingly more and more subtly and deeply at peace with your meditation object. It's a totally internal pleasure, which is just not subject to all the, the transience, the aging sickness and death of everything around us, not just the people, but the things, all of the, the changeability of conditioned things. We can cultivate this, these states of mind which don't have to age, grow sick, and die. And then he further modified this type of sukha that we can pleasure as saying uh, there are types of sukha which are to be pursued, developed, cultivated, which such as uh, the sukha of renunciation, nekama sukha, the sukha of seclusion, paviveka, the sukha of I got cheat sheet here. <laughs> the sukha of peace, the sukha of peace, and the sukha of um, the sukha of awakening. So some bodhi sukha. So these are, are great lists, and those aren't the only types of sukha. So the sukha of renunciation, the sukha of seclusion, uh, the sukha of awakening, and the sukha of peace. Uh, there are many types of sukha. You do a search in the Pali Canon, which I've done several times, for sukha, and you'll find all these different compounds. Pali is a bit like German, in that you can just create long strings of compounds which just elaborate on the concept. So you've got uh, the sukha of dana, or generosity, the sukha of faith, the sukha of kalyanamitta, the sukha of friendship, which is very much what uh, I feel when I go to a Bayagiri, or even coming here. I don't know most people here. The people who here who I do know, yeah, don't know you well, but there is a warmth. There is a warmth here. And um, the sukha of, of study, the sukha of uh, yeah, all sorts of different sukhas. Basically the wholesome internal happiness and gratification, well-being, that we can receive, which are much more independent from, uh, from the vicissitudes, all the change and changeability of the world around us. Since I was looking at these two lists, I was uh, yeah, thinking, how can I kind of get people to remember these lists? And as Ajahn Nisibo noted, I really do like mnemonic devices. So mnemonic memory, ways to memorize things. And I don't use, there's all sorts of ways to memorize things. You can, uh, yeah, have memory palaces where you're kind of walking through a whole mindscape of different uh, things you're memorizing, memorized through rhyme, um, and this is probably another talk. But one technique which I don't use often, but which is very good, is actually through melody. So as I was thinking about this type of, these type of pleasures which are not to be cultivated, uh, not to be pursued, versus the types of pleasures which 
Art to be Cultivated, the, a song popped up in my head. And it's interesting, you know, if you're taking the eight precepts, the sixth precept is to not engage in singing or listening to music. Or if you're a monk, it's definitely one of our rules. But how do you do this? Is this just, um, are you just supposed to shut your mind off if a, if a song comes up? Um, I find it quite fascinating to watch the mind that wants to, wants to sing and the movement outward, and it's kind of, it parallels this general outward going seeking that seeks gratification in the sight, sound, smells, taste, touch versus the internal gratification. So when this song came up, I'm kind of watching it and seeing if I can balance. Can I stay with, with the mind, stay internally balanced while this kind of stimulating song is going in my, my head? So it's a song which most people will know, and hopefully it will help you uh, memorize these different types of, of wholesome sukha. So the song is from The Sound of Music, and it's these are a few of my favorite things. So most of the things which Julie Andrews mentions, like raindrops on roses, and whiskers on kittens, and bright colored copper kettles, and perhaps some kind of mittens. Uh, these are, on one level, they're sensual pleasures, you know, and they're certainly benign sensual pleasures. No hate to cat whiskers, you know, no hate to <laughs> strudels and German noodles, etc. But they do change, and there, there is a type of, the Buddha was looking at a pleasure which is just comparatively much more stable and much more gratifying. And in comparison to this more subtle sukha, uh, the other type of sukha is just one, I don't need that. It's like when you grow up, you're not playing with the same kind of toys as you did when you were, when you were younger. Um, so to remember these type of wholesome sukhas, you've got the sukhas of stepping back, the independence and seclusion, peace, stilling, contentment, awakening, non-delusion, Faith, friendship, and virtue, study and offering. These are a few of my favorite things. Gosh, I, I've never sung so uh, downbeat and chant-like before. Um, <laughs> but it, it's interesting to watch the mind, uh, watch the mind go out with this enjoyment of sound, um, but to stay, to stay centered. So this sukkas, plural, of stepping back, this is nekama, which is often translated as renunciation. Uh, but literally, Sanskrit, wonderful language, it's a puzzle language. The root here is krum, which literally means to step forward, to move forward. Nis krum, nekama. Nis is almost away from, or here back. So stepping back, the sukha of stepping back. So this is like the Zen koan, or Zen meditative, approach the step back. So rather than stepping forward, jumping into, engaging with all the yeah, gratifying, beautiful things of the world, it's the sukha of stepping back. And then we have the sukhas of independence, seclusion, paviveka. So this is the sukha of, uh, yeah, it's the sukha of retreat you know, being able to um, step back, not just physically, kaya viveka, but also a mental step back, which is much more, much more important. Um, then you've got peace, stillness, contentment. This is upasama sukha. So the sukha, the happiness of, of peace, stillness, contentment, the type of happiness which just is doesn't experience FOMO. You're like, cool, you know, your friends are going out and there's no more, I'm sorry, it's the sukha of, what's the opposite of FOMO? JOMO. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've been in monasteries too long. Um, FOMO, so you're no longer fearing missing out what all your friends are doing, all the cool stuff they're doing, but you're just totally joyful, content. I can just sit here in the heart, with the heart, on my seat, and things are peaceful. And I don't need 
the constant hits from, uh, from anything else, just experiencing the bliss of, of sitting peacefully or doing all the other um, internally gratifying things that you can do. And you've got awakening, non-delusion. This is Sambodhi Sukha. So these are sukhas of uh, Bodhi, awakening, Sambodhi, uh, self-awakening. So these different flavors, the sukha of stepping back, independence, seclusion, peace, stilling, contentment, awakening, non-delusion. These are all, there's a certain flavor to them. And the more you practice meditation, and the more you really get a feel for this shift of attention, which does not have to limit itself to being on the cushion, but really is a shift of attention you can do at any time, uh, the more familiar you become with this flavor of, I'm totally good just at one remove. I don't need to be all up in a mix. I can just be, stand here and, and be happy. So those are the four types of, of sukha that are mentioned in that sutra, but then uh, sutta. But then elsewhere you've got uh, faith, friendship, virtue. So faith is sadha sukha, the sukha that you get um, from bowing, from seeing a Buddha rupa. And for Westerners, if we didn't grow up in a, a Buddhist culture, you might just be like, what? The happiness of bowing? Like, are you tripping? You know, it's like, you just, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't stick, but it doesn't make sense to you really. But if you, hopefully you can see the beauty in other people at least. Um, yeah, there are people who are not subservient or um, totally just um, servile and uh, deluded, but are actually, they know what the Buddha, a Buddha statue represents. They know what like a monk or a nun's robe represents. It represents exactly this kind of happiness. And when we bow to that, th those symbols, that's what we're bowing to. It's giving our, our life a direction. It's pointing the compass needle in a direction, which is great, having a direction in life. Uh, you know, because so much, I mean, Western culture, we just don't have clear directions. Uh, the compass just spins around and if we don't watch out, we can just head this way for a little bit and then shift and just not end up anywhere, but just going in, in circles. Uh, so having a clear direction. So learning this pleasure of, of faith. And if you don't like the word faith, that's great. The Buddha never used it. The word is sadha. So confidence, trust. And trust in what? Trust in something which is worthy of, of trust. Something which is solid. And that is something which is internal. So the, the sukha of sadha, of faith, friendship, and virtue. So friendship, kalyana mitta sukha. Yeah, it, this is a beautiful kind of, of happiness on the path, and it's a necessary part of the path. The Buddha said, spiritual friendship is not just the half of the holy life, it's the whole of the holy life. And the more you stick on this path, and hopefully the more you allow yourself to become a good friend, then the more you'll find yourself with really good friends and inspiring friends. And you'll find that quote from whoever that, you know, hell is other people or dukkha is other people. You'll find that whoever said that, it's just sad. It's just sad <laughs> that, you know, they had that approach, you know. Happiness is other people. I mean, certainly there's a truth, you know, to what the person said, but when you surround yourself, when you choose your surroundings and the people who you're wanting to live your, your life around, um, to the extent that you can do that, and then having the wisdom to approach those people who you didn't choose to be around, but who are nonetheless part of your life, when you have the wisdom to approach them uh, without making yourself suffer, then, yeah, happiness is other people. Happiness is uh, is Kalyanamitta for sure. So faith, friendship, virtue, uh, sila sukha, the sukha, the happiness, the pleasure of keeping precepts, keeping rules. Discipline equals freedom. And this is another thing which like Americans, 
we might not be used to thinking that. You're like, rules, that's like the opposite of fun. That's like the opposite of, of happiness. Um, and maybe that's true if you've been forced down by a set of rules uh, in the past, rules without meaning or that have been compelled upon you. Um, but with these precepts, I undertake the precept to refrain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, uh, intoxicants. I undertake it. It's a rule of training. It's not a law. It's not forced from any God. I'm training in this. And you undertake it voluntarily. I mean, yeah, we're not forcing anybody. And, and you'll see when you have this sense of inner strength and inner, it, they become something which you can base a wholesome sense of pride on. You might say a wholesome sense of self on even. You self? Didn't the Buddha teach non-self? The Buddha definitely taught non-self. But he also taught uh, skill in self, atta sampada. Sampada is uh, perfection or cultivation of self. There is a very serious place for wholesome self-esteem, for a wholesome sense of self. And that's something which, if you've ever heard the term spiritual bypassing, that's what spiritual bypass is missed, is I'm just gonna go straight for non-self, straight for emptiness, forget about all the, you know, dirt of fixing the relationships in my life and my own stinginess, et cetera. Um, just go straight for emptiness. But yeah, when you confront your own miserliness, your own stinginess by giving a gift, you're improving your egoic sense of self, which is not ultimately uh, foundational or bedrock, but uh, it can be a, a sense of, uh, it can bring a sense of uh, of well-being, it definitely does. So, faith, friendship, virtue, study, bahusuta or sutta. Uh, this can be fun uh, for certain people. Um, if you're not into study, or if you've already done your master's and your doctorate, and you're like, dude, I don't want to hear the lists. Just stop talking and let me do the meditation. Fair enough. But it, you, if you're someone who likes, oh, I like the lists, and your mind's like, oh, this is something. This is a wholesome way to uh, uh, nourish oneself on the path if you're of that disposition. It can be a source of happiness. So learning or study and offering, these are a few of my favorite things. So dana sukha, the pleasure of offering. And hopefully everybody knows the beginnings of the taste of that. And hopefully everybody, absolutely including myself, can more and more learn from the beauty that we see as monastics, every single calorie that we've eaten, that any monk or nun uh, has eaten for the whole of their monastic life has been given. Every single calorie has been put into our bowls or put onto a plate, which is much less frequent, but put into our bowls. That's my whole body, our whole bodies Every cell has been nourished on the, the generosity of others. And when you see the smiles of people giving, it converts your heart that says, Kobe Lil, why are you being stingy? You know, like you've been nourished uh, so deeply every single day. Haven't you learned the lesson yet? In a friendly way, you know. You know, there's so many good examples you're surrounded by. Can I be better at giving? Can I more and more know the deep satisfaction of giving? Uh, can I just let go? That's all it takes. Just let go. Just you're holding on and you just let go, let the whatever it is fall into uh, the monk's bowl or the nun's bowl or your child's bowl or your spouse's bowl or your friend's bowl or their plate or whatever else other people eat off of. <laughs> um, so Ajahn Nisabo framed these types of sukha. So you got the, the gratification of the senses, the kama guna, uh, the kama sukha, which the Buddha said, if there was no gratification in the sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, then people wouldn't become addicted. But because there is gratification, there is a measure of happiness in these things, people become addicted. Um, so there is a measure of happiness there. But the more you're on this path, the more you see this. There's a cleaner, there's a cleaner type of pleasure. Uh, many different types of cleaner types of pleasures. And you can climb in that, that direction. In Ajahn Nisabo's comparing of these things, it's like the sukha or the happiness that you get from feeding from feeding, just from consuming, sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, versus the happiness you get from, from blessing. So 
just to recap that mnemonic is the sukkahs of stepping back, independence, seclusion, peace-stilling contentment, awakening, non-delusion, faith, friendship, and virtue, study and offering. These are a few of my favorite Buddhist things. And they're not just Buddhist, everybody, so don't feel like you have to convert because you can all, everybody can experience these, uh, these types of happiness. So leave things, leave that there. So we can open things up to questions, um, both for people in person and online. And uh, I think we have, um, yeah. Is it working? Hello. Great. Thank you for the talk, Ajahn. Um, when it comes to the sukha of seclusion, I've definitely struggled with that idea more. Because um, from my understanding, at least in the lineage, sort of, that was followed here with the Ajahn Cha, community is an important piece in the monastery life. Uh, but like looking at the suttas, the Buddha's like, you know, you should probably maybe hang out a little bit less and enjoy sitting more. But yeah, I'd, but then the Kalyana Mid is another piece of that. So yeah, well, what does seclusion actually look like to embrace? But thank you. Yeah, it's a, a great question. How do you balance uh, seclusion, which a big part of it is physical seclusion, like getting back to your hut. You hear that so many times in your monastery, like after the meal, just go back to your hut. <laughs> um, with the happiness of, uh, with friendship, with Kalyanamitta. And it's a, a great question, and I think there's no one right answer. And you can see the, um, when you kind of miss the mark on both accounts, you know, if if I'm holding too tightly to this ideal of seclusion and I just run away after the meal, like somebody wants to talk to me and I'm, I'm like, anything that gets in the way of me and my hut is an annoyance or anything that gets in the way of me and coming to the meditation sit or me and sitting is annoying and I hate it. You know, that kind of aversive push away. Um, yeah, that is not part of the path. You know, so how do you do this pulling back without pushing, without pushing away? How do you just settle back without pushing away? And it's almost something which you have to figure out with every interaction. I mean, if you can design your life towards more and more uh, peaceful environments and uh, design a life which is more and more uh, allowing of space and allowing of time with good friends, time with you know friends who care about the same things as you do about the path, about, about seclusion. You know, the Buddha said, there's actually paviveka kata. So the Buddha talked about when you're with friends, you should actually talk about seclusion, which you might think, oh, that's, that's, that's like the worst party pooper ever. <laughs> it's like you, your friend comes up to you and you're like, oh, it'd be great to be back, back in my hut right now. <laughs> Where do you go from there? But you can talk about these things and it's really useful, um, especially if the person isn't running away. So. Um, yeah, some thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts, Ajahn. I think um, one also really useful um, paradigm of not self or anatta in Buddhism is the way of looking at each person around you and yourself as a kind of amalgamation of different, uh, what we call sankara or program, um, sort of the personality, uh, habit patterns, and these ingrained. Uh, ways we uh, interact with the world. And um, etymologically, Sankara in uh, Vedic thought was also, could mean ritual. Um, so instead of kind of measuring things by how many people you're around, really looking at each person as kind of this collection of bright and dark Sankara. And, you know, can you just surround yourself with a lot of bright Sankara? And that might mean pulling away from certain people a bit who are, have, uh, you know, maybe not the most wholesome effect on you. But 
it very much means for moderns drawing close to the bright Sankara. Um, and, you know, especially in places that are held and structured around that, um, like, you know, even a Saturday gathering or a, a monastery. And the Buddha was giving the teachings on seclusion in a profoundly integrated society. You know, you go to villages in Thailand and there are, uh, you know, a child will be raised by three or four houses. And as moderns were profoundly isolated and siloed. So I think really steering, you know, Jack Cornfield confronted Longport Shaw once and said, I hear you, you know, speaking with one person, you'll say one thing and another person, you'll say another thing. And Longport Shaw said, look, it's like I'm walking, watching someone walk down the road and they start veering left and I say, go right, go right. Or they start veering right and I say, go left, go left. And we very much have to go, go left, go left. Um, if left was being with, with people uh, that are wholesome Kali and Amitta. So I think really paying attention to that and just you'll feel it in your body, the sense of trivialness versus really wholesome being with, with, with people. And if being with a certain friend or group feels trivial and like you're wasting your time, then that's, that's just a relevant data point. Not that you need to push away right away, but you want to feel like you're using this time well and in a nourishing way as well. So. Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome back. On, hello? Oh, okay. Welcome back, Ajahn Kublo. Um, this is, sometimes I think about synchronicity because I was just having this uh, thought. And I, first, I'll be prefaced by saying I had the good fortune to go down to Abhaygiri in April, and I know exactly what you're talking about, about the lights and the darks, you know, the sukha and the dukkha. Um, I've been going through this series of, on the Satipasthana Sutta by, um, <coughs> Joseph Goldstein, and I love it. I love it so much, and there is so much to it. Uh, but when he mentions somebody, you know, like Bua Bua or, you know, Roya Khan or so, from all these traditions, I like stop the, the tape or, you know, stop the thing, and then I look it up on Wikipedia and I read the Wikipedia page, and so I get far afield. I wonder if it's, if I'm doing the wrong thing by having this joy of study by doing this, or if I should just sit and listen to the entire hour long talk to to enhance my concentration and maybe then look up some of these things. It's just this kind of simple question. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And talk about synchronicity. I was just with Ajahn Pasano this past Wednesday, and he was talking about listening to those Joseph Goldstein, that series on the Satipatthanas. So yeah, I think I've listened to part of it, but it, it sounds great from what I've heard. I'm glad you're listening to that too. Um, yeah, but the joy of study uh, and how to balance it. I think a good thing for me is starting with a clear intention of time parameter. So whether it's 25 minutes or whether it's an hour or whatever, uh, whether that's for your study or for your meditation, like having a clear boundary, because that just, that does cultivate this habit of, of discipline and, and restraint. Um, and, but just knowing yourself too. I mean, it doesn't really make sense. All of us have our outer limit of how much meditation, time-wise, is beneficial in any one sit. All of us have our, our different end points where beyond that, it's actually, it can be a bit counterproductive. You're just, you're drowning in dukkha versus uh, swimming with dukkha, which is like the zone of proximal development, the, the, the area where you're, you're learning, you're getting to be a better swimmer. Um, so knowing exactly what that is, or a, approximately what it is, for you with meditation, setting your timer for that amount of time. And then when Joseph Goldstein mentions, uh, I agree, he's so good at quotes, yeah? I mean, I've done the same, um, or like wanting to write them down at least, but it's a good habit to say, okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna write this down. I've set my time for this amount of time on the clock and I'm, I'm not gonna you know, open my eyes or open Google or anything until that's done. So I think that's a good balance, but definitely not tamping down the love of study or the, the wholesome love of gratifying dharmic study. So, yeah. Good question. Ajahn? Thank you for your talk. Um, I also think about the sukha of there are times in my mind 
when thoughts come up and then there's like a, a Dhamma gift that comes in and challenges the thought and there's this kind of sense of almost a smile comes to my face and it kind of calls BS on, the, on that and just, um, so d where does that fit in? I mean, it feels like real happiness when that, when that happens. Yeah, it's a, a great, um, almost conundrum for people who haven't really experienced that in meditation. How can it be that um, I'm telling part of myself, telling some voices in my head to, you know, shut up or calm down, but then actually get some level of gratification. It's not coming from a mean place, which most times in the world when you hear someone say shut up, it's almost, yeah, it's tinged with this aversiveness, if not overboiling, you know, with, with aversiveness and hatred even. Um, but yeah, when you, when you can feel that, okay, just shut up. <laughs> when you well, can just... And also there's the, the, the new information that comes in. Mm. Um, it's not just, that's not true, but then there's like, oh, just, just allow this part of life to surface. Just allow it. Yeah. And that's just such a, a point of, of joy, yeah. of that allowing. Yeah, that's wonderful. There's a Dhammapada verse where the Buddha talks about Dhamma Piti Sukhang Seti. So uh, one who can be translated as one who drinks in the Dhamma or one who has the rapture of the Dhamma. They sleep in happiness or they live in happiness. So, if um, only. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like that's what you're talking about, this Dhamma Piti. That's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I'm glad to hear you experience that. Morning, Ajahn. Welcome for welcome back for your two month uh, summer sabbatical, I guess. Um, in your 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 Dhamma talk, you mentioned uh, the sukha of independence, and uh, I wonder how that fits in. If you're already liking seclusion, and you're already uh, realizing every other human being is nothing but dukkha, then not saying who I'm talking about, but what what is the 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 sukha of independence? Yeah, I mean, uh, that was just my translation for paviveka, which is more usually translated as seclusion. Um, but it really, seclusion in English doesn't necessarily have this meaning of, of internal seclusion. And what, or chitta viveka, it doesn't have this sense of independence. And that's, so that's my translation of the, the mental aspect of seclusion. You're independent, you know, I, uh, in terms of getting sustenance, getting nourishment, satisfaction internally. I'm, I'm independent. I don't need to, to depend and attach and cling to sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, cat whiskers or, you know, pots and strudels and noodles and things. So, yeah. Thank you. I think it also um, relates a bit to the So much of dukkha is um, to do with uh, upadana, or what the Buddha defined as craving, or kind of feeding off of something and uh, circling around it. So the metaphor or analogy is often a flame feeding off of a piece of wood. And um, with the second knowing, noble truth being letting go of, of suffering, and then the third being release, there's this um, thing where when we let go of what's most prominent uh, in our experience like that dukkha or um, that what you let go into is a, a profound deeper happiness and uh, it takes a while you know you, you let go of something and you find after a few minutes that you see your palms are filled with sunlight you know and, and it's like the issue is that there's a delay in that happening and to have the patience to, to wait for the the void to become a doorway. And so much of pulling back or even what Suze is talking about with like, you know, you see this sort of suffering thought which grabs your attention, like when something's in your eye, the whole world is the something in your eye. And uh, when you, when the Dhamma comes and speaks to you, there is this happiness of letting go. And 
there's so much to be said for just holding still enough where the waiting becomes, um, uh, there's a T.S. Eliot line from the Four Quartets where he said, wait without hope for you are not ready for hope. Wait without thought for you're not ready for thought. Hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Thought would be thought of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the hope are all in the waiting. And eventually, you know, there will be light and the laughter of, I think it's uh, the laughter of strawberries and things like that. Not the laughter of strawberries, but it's something like that. And, <laughs> there, uh, and yeah, this idea like that independence, so much of the Buddhist teaching focuses on what we're letting go of because it's so much easier to talk about that than what you're letting go into. But we're aiming for, you know, empty of self, but full of reality, full of Dhamma, you know, it's, it's not a void. If you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand and we will also call on you, but we have room for others. I've got a question here on Zoom that I was going to read out. Sorry for this reverb thing happening. Um, let's see. Uh, this is from Walter. I have been practicing for quite a while, since 1987, and have been associated with three monasteries, Bhavana, Meta Forest, and Forest Dhamma. I would estimate that 90% of the Western monks who were ordained disrobed, often within the first year, but also after some years, one after 17 years. To what do you attribute this? <laughs> I'm just the messenger. <laughs> I know it's, it's totally normal. Like disrobing is the norm in Thailand. Probably 99%, if not more, of people who ordain will disrobe because it's, it's a tradition. I mean, people ordain just for three months in, in the West, these um, Ajahn Chah monasteries or Wat Metta uh, affiliate or uh, adjacent. Um, yet we aren't asking for, for lifetime vows as they do in some places in Sri Lanka or in Bangladesh. Um, but yeah, people can disrobe anytime, anytime they want, and it's hard, and it's definitely not for everybody. Um, it wouldn't make sense. Um, it, it's definitely not for everybody. People have different commitments and different things which let them, you know, let the heart kind of shine. Um, it's a little, it's sometimes sad, certainly, when you come to a monastery and see that, or if you're a guest and you're seeing people disrobe, it's, it can be kind of sad, especially if you're inspired by the, by the archetype and you're like, oh, what are they doing? You know, I would give, I would give my life if I could be ordained. Um, but yeah, everybody's got their own, their own kama. And the more you're around these monasteries, your friends kind of like drop off, you know, over and over. And the longer you stay in robes, like almost the fewer and fewer peers you have. Um, but it, it's normal. And it's not like somebody disrobes and then they're, they're gone. Um, you know, oftentimes people will stay around the monasteries. Um, but it's... It's dukkha and figuring out exactly how to thrive off of these alternate, alternative types of happiness, which we're not, we're, which we're not used to, um, and yeah, it, it, it's a struggle for everybody. Um, yeah, it's a really, really relevant question for practitioners in general too. Um, the uh, you know, I think what we, we get in the early Buddhist texts in the Theravada is the Buddha gave us this unbelievably concise, uh, clear teaching. It, it's almost like a doctor taking a, a scalpel to, um, to our situation. And um, he meant this teaching to last for millennia. And it's, you know, the monastic Sangha is the second oldest institution in the world, except for the Jains who beat us by a few years. And um, that's because he gives us this like kernel, this powerful teaching. Um, but it, it's also kind of, um, it's clear cutness uh, sometimes, and especially how it was brought into Thailand um, in this culture that's filled with metta. So a lot of the articulations you get from the Thai Theravada are very much, um, basically pulling, uh, you know, have a certain fire and brimstone feel. 
and you take that and you transplant it to the modern era or the West, and it's like it can be like mixing acid with acid a bit, because so many moderns, because of Judeo-Christian heritage and consumerist culture, which depends on making us feel like we're not good enough to buy things, it's you know we're already self-critical, and then you mix in some fire and brimstone, and it's it can dry people up really fast. So I think just to acknowledge, like this tradition is just now transplanting to the modern era and and to the West, and it's still adjusting. So where the articulations coming from Thailand, I think were quite hard for some Western or modern character types to adjust to, um, to have a certain softer feel, say, and, and more allowance for um, like encouraging social connection in certain contexts. Um, uh, that's just beginning to adjust uh, to, the, to the modern space here. And, uh, you know, initially, I've heard one senior monastic say that tradition was a bit of a monoculture, and everyone who didn't fit right into that personality type, uh, it was very hard to stay in robes. But, you know, this is a millennia old tradition. We're just now, in these last few years, trying to figure out how to make it accommodate more uh, of the modern neuroses. And um, I just think it's really important to emphasize flourishing, normalcy, warmth, community, actually. Um, and that's the counterbalance I think so many of us need. So it definitely is a problem with monastics disrobing in that way. And I think it doesn't have to be like that. Even though like Gajin Kobilo says, there's, you know, not everyone's gonna be a monastic and yeah. I think we may have to wrap things up actually. Okay. Um, Ajahn, thank you so much for the talk and welcome back. Yeah.